great to have that quiet moment with Jesus. The important part of what we do every Sunday, central to what we come together for, is to remember the cross and his resurrection, and we celebrate that together. I'm grateful to do that, and I'm telling you, two weeks into it, I'm loving Monsi and his energy, and just great to see the worship team just jamming up here. It's fun. It's fun to watch and fun to be a part of that. Hope you're enjoying that at home. I have a question to begin. I'm going to ask you that are here in the audience, but I also want you to chat in on online, if you will. How many of you like to camp? I'm talking like tent camping, sleeping bag camping. I just want to see a show of hands. I can barely see you, sorry. But some of you like to camp, some of you at home. I've got only a few camp stories because camping and me never really got along together. Camping for me, the best camping for me is the one where you go to the Marriott on the beach and get to enjoy the pool in a nice warm bed every night. Some of you are giving me an amen for that, right? But let me tell you my camp stories and probably why I never really was into camping like many of you. When I was about 16 years old, uh, we had a youth group camp. They went overnight. It was like the kickoff camp for the youth group in, the, in late summer. They went up to this place called Mohican where there was canoeing and you would go for the weekend. And it was the welcome the freshman camp. You guys know what I'm talking about. No, you have no idea. They would take the freshmen, they would bring them into the group, and that would be their way of getting them connected to the youth group. And I was a sophomore at the time. My brother was a freshman. So we got into our car on Saturday. We were a day late. I had to work Saturday. So we get into my mom's station wagon. It's the only car she had. I got to borrow it for the weekend. And we drove up, and we get to this campsite after dark, northern Ohio. Now, here's what happened. We pull into the campsite. I'm looking for our youth group. I can't find them. Like all these people camping, campfires, all that stuff. Our youth group was nowhere to be found. They were all over the place. There was no central place where they were all at. They were just scattered everywhere. So I find one friend from the youth group and we pull out our sleeping bags, no tent, put our sleeping bags out on the ground. No kidding. Ten minutes later, rain starts to come down. I said, enough of this. This is my first camping experience. Enough of this. I'm going back to the station wagon. My brother and I take off to the station wagon, hide in the station wagon all night, windows fogging up, all that kind of stuff. We slept in the station wagon. Terrible, terrible sleep. Next morning, we get up for breakfast. I'm thinking, okay, they're going to have a campfire. They're going to have something. We get up. They have nothing. There's nobody that's got breakfast organized. Somebody gave me a donut from their car from the day before. And then... They tell us we're going to go canoeing. So it's, it's still raining. It's still really raining down on us. Ohio style rain, not this Tracy rain you guys get. Ohio rain. And we go to the river and we get our canoes. And my brother and I get in the canoe. And here's what I did not know. I, was, I didn't get to go the year before. So my brother was a freshman. I'm a sophomore. We get around the first bend of the river. And that is the spot where they initiate all the freshmen. The way they initiate all the freshmen is to dump their boats. Nothing in my boat was secure for water. Everything comes out. We're soaked to the brim. They dump me with my brother. I'm yelling at him. I'm a sophomore. Don't dump me. Into the water you go. Soaking wet. Miles down the river. We're just drenched in rain all day long. Get home. Get back in the car. We're just wet to the brim. My mom was really mad about the fact that we got the car seats so wet. We get home. My mom sees us come in the door. She sees these two drenched rats come in the door. And she says, how was it? And my brother says, it was awesome. <laughs> and I said, I am never going camping again. <laughs> That's my story. I'm sticking to it. What's your camp story? See, I only have a few, so I'm going to exhaust them today, but we're going to do a series out of the book of Numbers where the Israelites were camping for 40 years. Not just a few years, not just to get to the promised land, 40 years. They didn't know it when they left Egypt, but they were going to be camping for many of them the rest of their lives. Anybody want to sign up for that today? I want us to look at some of the stories out of the book of Numbers because camping, here's the thing I know about camping. Camping has this incredible propensity to teach us life lessons. 
It really does. Even my poor camping experience has taught me some things about camping that applies to life. And I've really learned from that, especially over the years. And today in Numbers chapter 2, we're going to look at the first lesson I want to teach you about camping that applies to your life and to mine. I want you to hear this clearly. It's a simple lesson. It's a simple story. Everything I just told you about my story can relate to what I'm going to learn and teach out of Numbers chapter 2 today. And we're only going to look at a few verses. I hope you'll read through the whole chapter today. Now, Numbers chapter 1 is a census. God takes a census of Israel. This is after the Ten Commandments, after Mount Sinai. They've been traveling for about a year. They've been at Mount Sinai for about a year. They've received the Ten Commandments, Golden Calf, all that stuff in the book of Exodus. And then in the numbers, God says, okay, take a survey of all the fighting men in your camp, 603,000 men of all the tribes, not counting Levi. And he's going to do that at the end as well to show that God could keep the whole camp going in spite of losing a whole generation. We'll get to that later. But in Numbers chapter 2, God is going to arrange the camp. I wish God would have done that with my camping experience. It would have been a whole lot better. And I'm telling you today, listen carefully. If you're listening online, if you're watching here right now, I'm telling you today, if you learn how to let God organize your life the way he's going to organize this camp, you will have a much greater life. In fact, many of you came today. You didn't know this when you came. But God's speaking to you today through this chapter because he wants you to organize your life again after a year of chaos. You didn't know it when you came, but God is going to use what I'm going to show you today out of this couple of verses to help you get into a position for God to pour blessing on you if you'll do what he's going to teach us today. Here's how it starts, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron. The Israelites are to camp around the tent of meeting, some distance from it, each of them under their standard and holding the banners of their family. Listen to that again. The Israelites, here's what we're going to do, guys. Um, Two million of you, maybe more. I'm going to organize you right now, and here's how we're going to do it. You're going to camp around the tent of meeting, some distance away from it, And you'll have your banner, your standard to recognize who you are and where you're at. I'm going to put that in the ground wherever you're at, holding the banners of their family. Now you're reading that thing. Okay, cool, great. There's so much here. In fact, I'm going to give you three principles about how God organizes your life and how he wants to organize you just like you would a campsite right here. Here's the first rule. Number one, make the Lord the leader. Make the Lord, your leader. You notice what he starts here. He doesn't wait for a committee meeting. He's not saying, guys, what do you think you should do? He's not saying, hey, hang on a second, Moses, Aaron, pull the people. You did the census. Now ask them how they want us to do this camp, how they want it organized. No, God says, the Lord tells Moses and Aaron, here's how we're going to do this camp. The Lord, when you see the word Lord capitalized, all four letters capitalized, what you're reading is the name of God that God gave Moses in Exodus chapter 3, Yahweh. We're not even saying it correctly, but that's the closest we can get to it. He's using his own name here to say, I am the authority. I am the leader. I am the, help me, Lord. Man, if my camping experience, that first camping experience, would have had a leader that just took charge and organized the camp, I would have had a whole different experience. But it felt like I was alone and lost because I didn't have a leader to look to. And God is saying, I'm your leader. I'm your authority. Moses, Aaron, you tell the people, here's how we're doing camp. By the way, They thought maybe they were camping for a few weeks or months. They were going to camp for 40 years. Wonder how that felt. It's kind of good to establish who the leader is if we're going to go camping that long. I I was remembering back some different experiences that I call camping. They weren't really camping. One of them was the first trip we took 
uh, to Honduras as a mission team when we started the church. This is back in 2005, I think. We had a group that was in conjunction with another church, went to Honduras to, and we were a part of a dorm experience. And the dorms were really cool. They were clean, they had air conditioning, they had tile flooring, and we had bunk beds to sleep in. It was really good. It was better than camping in the rain out on the ground. Let me say it that way. But we get down there, we've flown all night, we're tired, we get to the campsite, and this lady who was in charge of our teams had us come into the meeting area, and she pulls out these four or five pages and gives them to everybody, and she goes through four or five pages of rules. And I'm about through page two, I'm already so tired, I'm ready to go to sleep, and I'm listening to this, and I'm thinking, are you kidding me? I mean, silly rules. You got to... You got to take raid and spray it around the door. The last person in every night, spray the raid around the door when you go into the dorm room. You got to wear flip-flops to go to the bathroom. We're talking tile, clean. It's a, the place is nice. It's like a hotel room. I hate wearing flip-flops, and I certainly don't want to take them and put them on in the middle of the night going to the bathroom. And on and on she went. Second night. I wake up in the middle of the night, and I'm old, so you guys can appreciate this, you know. You have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. I get out of my bunk, climb down, just in the dark, walk into the bathroom, and I'm doing my business, and I hear a noise. And so I didn't know what was going on, so I had my flashlight with me. I don't even know why I took it, but I had my flashlight with me. I turned it on. Here's a scorpion with his tail facing me in the corner of the bathroom. Guess what? I wore my flip-flops from that point on. I listened to the rules a whole lot closer because apparently they knew more about the situation than I did. Lord is telling Moses and Aaron, I know more about the situation than you ever will. So here's how we're going to organize this. Camp. And I'm just telling you today, if you feel like your life's out of control, if you feel like it's disorganized, if you don't know what to do next, if you're worried about the future, maybe, maybe you've forgotten who the Lord of the camp is. Maybe today's the day you say, God, it's been a chaotic year, but today I'm letting you organize our camp. I'm letting you decide how you want us to live going forward. I'm letting you be Lord. Make the Lord your leader. Second principle I pull out of this is look at this. I want you to set up the camp around the tent of meeting, but some distance from it. Around the tent of meeting. Here's what they did. Now, two million plus people, that's the size of San Jose or Sacramento, greater Sacramento. Take all those people, send them out of Egypt, cross the Red Sea, get them to Sinai. They're not organized. And God gives them instructions in that year on how to build this tabernacle, tents around the facility, a tent of meeting in the middle. His presence would come down on the tent of meeting, cloud by day, fire, pillar of light by night. And here he is, he's saying, I want to be in the center. I want you to organize your whole entire nation around me. I don't don't want to be on the outskirts. I don't want to be a part of your life. I don't want you to think of me as something you just add on when you need it. I, I want you to see me, camp, as the center of everything. Now, this is really cool. Think about this. Every time they were camped and moved, God would be at the center of their entire nation. He, he would be there, his presence would be in the midst of them. If you ever wanted to know where you were at, all you had to look for was the cloud or the pillar. And you knew right where you were at. You knew whose you were. You knew where you were. But not only that, he, then he says, I want you to put the tent in the meeting, and, but then camp away from it. And the Levites would be the first around that. You can read this in the chapter. The Levites would be the first around that tent. They'd be a distance from it, but they would be the ones that are serving God around that tent. And then outside of that, three tribes to the north, three tribes to the east, three tribes to the south, three tribes to the west, Levites in the center, gap 
to the tent. You got that in your mind. You got a picture of that. Are you listening at home? God is saying, I want to be the center, but I also don't want you to forget I'm holy. I want to be... I want to be your presence, but I also want to be your conscience. I I don't ever want you to forget who's at the center of your life, and I don't ever want you to forget who consecrates your life. Put me at the center of your life. And I'm telling you, friends, when this pandemic started over a year ago, it was amazing how people started to do that. But isn't it interesting how when we get comfortable when things go on, when we get our own schedules back, when we, we start to move God out of center and put other things there. Years ago when we started the church, we got to go visit a friend in Longmont, Colorado, just north of Denver. They, they were working for this great church. Rick Rousseau was the pastor there. He had taken this church and grown it into this amazing church. He was working with the community. I valued him more than most of the pastors I ever met because he did kind of what my mindset was, to be a community-minded pastor, not just a church-minded pastor. And he was, fortunately for me, he was willing to share with me what he was doing in the community. We were having this conversation. He pulls out this map, this design, and Rick Rousseau was in conversations with a new village that they were just starting to build somewhere outside of Longmont. He got to be a part of the planning commission, I think it was, to design this new village. And the one thing he said that really caught my attention was this, that, you know, at the center of a town, when you design a town, what's at the center of a town describes what your town is all about. If you put business at the center of town, then you're really about business. If you put government buildings at the center of town, like many of them do, you're about power and government. If if you put um, community functions at the center of town, like a stadium or things at the events, then you're describing to the community what your community is all about. And he said, I want you to see that for generations, for decades, for, for millennia, the church was at the center and we've pushed it out. It's no longer the center of the community. It's on the outskirts. And God, in his incredible wisdom, said, I want you to never forget that I need to be at the center of your life. I need to be at the center of your community. I need to be at the center of your family. And oh, by the way, I need to be the center of your worship and the center of your own devotional life. What's at the center of your life these days? If you're listening at home, what's what's the thing that you make the center of your day? When you came into worship today, you saw what was at the center of every worship service we do. It's the remembrance of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I don't care where you place it in the service. That's why we come to gather, is to celebrate and remember. That isn't my direction. That's what Jesus said to do. And I wonder what's at the center of your life these days. And then finally, look at what the last thing is. Each man under his standard with the banners of his family. Under his standard with the banners of his family. When you hear the word standard, you don't think of it like a Jew does. A Jew thinks of the standard like an identifier flag. Something that they could look to and say, oh yeah, that's where I belong. That's that's my nation. That's my tribe. That's my family. I know right where I'm at when I see the flag, when I see the standard. It brings order to my life. When you think of standard, the way we've converted that, it's to some rule of thumb or way people do things, an an order of the way things are completed or done in a specific area of your life. But to them, it was visible. And what he's saying is, listen, what he's saying is, I'm at the center, my standard is visible to the entire nation, Then I've organized the tribes around the center so that you can know right where you're at by looking at the tribes 
flag. And then when you're in that tribe, let's say you're from the tribe of Judah, you can go right to that area, know right where you're at and see your family's flag and know exactly who you are and exactly where you are. It's really cool. You know, it's like I was looking for when I went camping. I was looking for something to identify my youth group, something to identify where I belonged and couldn't find it. And here's why that matters. Because God in his infinite wisdom was saying, when you make me your authority, when you put me at the center, I want you to never forget you belong here. I want you to never forget I am your protection. I am your banner. I am your guardian. I am the one that walks before you. And here, this is so cool. Think about it for a second. Every time that God would lift up his spirit and move with the camp, the Levites would pack up everything, the tabernacle and all that stuff. They'd bring out the ark. The ark would go in front of them. And then you would see this series of flags leave the camp. Everybody had a place. Everybody had a purpose. Everybody knew whose they were. (laughs) You can't miss that. God says, I want you to realize you are carrying a flag of identity as a part of my kingdom. So that's why I kind of drew my own little flag here. Don't laugh at my artwork. But I just said, if my family would be identified, if people would, from the outside looking in would say, here's what the McFarlands are all about. Here's, here's who they really think they are. If my neighbors looked at me, if my family looked at me, if you guys looked at me, what do I want my standard to be? And I figured that out and told Diana and drew it on the standard. I don't know if it's accurate. I just know that's what I want it to be. I wonder what your neighbors think your standard is. I wonder what the community thinks Journey's standard is. I hope it's the same standard that he wanted all of them to know. Let the Lord be the order. Him first, tribe, family. Me. You know, one of the guys that was in the middle of that was a guy by the name of Joshua. And later on in his writings, in his book, as he led the nation, you know what he would say at the very end of his life? I don't care what you choose. I don't care how you pick. But as for me and my house, do you know the verse? We will serve the Lord. You know what he was saying? That's my standard. That's who we are. That's what my family is about. And I want to fly that flag so that everybody knows. We live in a generation that tries to hide their flag. No more. Set your standard and fly it. And let the world know whose authority you're under. So make the Lord your leader. Put the Lord at the center. Let the Lord... Set the order, and guess what? You'll have a good camping experience. You'll have a better life experience. And look at the very end of chapter 2, verse 34, just one last verse. So the Israelites did everything the Lord commanded. Say that with me. Everything the Lord commanded. You at home too. Everything the Lord commanded. They commanded Moses. That is the way they encamped under their standards. And that is the way they set out, each of them with their clan and family. What a great verse. Simple lesson. And what that verse is saying is they followed the Lord in obedience. For a moment, they got it right. They did well. They're going to mess up. When we talk about complaining next week, you'll see it didn't take very long. You'll want to be here for that one. But Israel will face ruthless enemies, dangerous conditions, difficult situations, and yet they're going to overcome when they follow everything the Lord commanded. 
And friends, if you want a good camp experience, if you want a great life experience, learn from the Israelites. Because every time they messed up, it didn't go well. But when they followed everything the Lord commanded, they had a good camp. Two last stories together. When Diane and I were serving as volunteers at our home church, we su supported the youth ministry and they went to Christ and Youth Conferences every year. They would take 30, 40, 50 students at times to these camps. Now these camps were on college dorms, my kind of camp, I'm just saying. And they would go there and again, there would be a set of rules for you to be on college. I thought that was great for them to experience a college environment before they graduated high school. I thought that was a great idea. And so they would go through and here's the rules that the college requires you to obey. Well, one year we had about three or four teenage boys and they, did, they ignored the rules, broke most of them, went out one night after curfew, did some damage to a lo location on the site. And here's the problem. When you break the rules of the college, there's only one other outcome after that. You call your parents, and the parents have to drive wherever you're at, it was eight hours, and pick their kids up and bring them home. And our youth, just like Josh would tell you, our youth ministry tried everything we could not to have to send a kid home. We really, that was the last thing we ever wanted to do. But in this case, we had no other option. So can you imagine how hard it was just to listen to this they had to call their parents, tell them what they did, and mom and dad have to drive eight hours that night to pick them up the next morning and take them home. It was terrible. I just don't even want to imagine what that eight-hour drive home was like. The next year, same group of students, first to sign up for CIY. When we get to the camp and that first night we're going through the rules, guess who's telling the rest of the students how to follow the rules? Those four students. We had the best week we ever had. More people came to Jesus because of those four boys leading our group because they had learned the tough lesson that when it comes to who's in authority and who's at the center and who do we follow, we follow the Lord. Maybe your life feels chaotic right now. Maybe you're struggling with stuff in your life. Many of us are. I got good news for you today. If you listen to what God told Moses and Aaron and make him your authority, center your life around him, follow his orders, you're going to discover a great camp experience. And some of you today came and you've never surrendered to Jesus. You could do that today. We just simply practice what Peter and the rest of the disciples did, calling you to make a confession of faith, surrendering your life to Jesus, repent and be baptized, and start to put the Lord at the center of your life. He's ready to welcome you into his camp today. And if you want to respond, all you have to do is come see me at the end of this service or talk to one of our staff members. We will help you make that decision. Jesus, I pray today that we, as we start this series out of numbers, you would show us great lessons from not just the Israelites camping stories, but from the life stories they teach us. I pray today we would dig deeper into your word in the next several weeks. I pray that it would come to life in us and create this character and lessons that we need to learn from you. Help us to be people that make you our leader, put you at the center and let follow your orders. And thank you that you love us enough and are merciful enough to keep calling us back. That you care about us enough to invite us into your camp. Help us to be the ones who follow. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.